and welcome to our next lesson in Chem 1. And in today's lesson, we're going to learn about something called thermochemical equations. And we're going to learn about calorimetry and how to determine the enthalpy change or the heat of a reaction. All right, so thermochemical equations are how we write chemical equations and also at the same time show the enthalpy change or the delta H of the reaction. So in thermochemical equations, we're going to have that delta H of the reaction, the enthalpy change, the heat of the reaction, shown along with, we also have to have the states of both the reactants and the products. And the reason for the having the states is important because it takes energy, um, it takes energy to uh, to make something from a liquid into a gas, or you get energy back when you turn something from a gas into a liquid. And so um, that's going, that would change what the delta H would be overall. The delta H is written to the right of the reaction, and it has to have the correct sign. And you'll see how that works in a moment. So, for example, if we take calcium oxide and we put that into water, we're going to make calcium hydroxide. This reaction has a negative delta H. The delta H would be negative 65.2, and we're going to say kilojoules per mole. It's always going to be per mole as it's written. And because it's negative, that's an exothermic reaction. So always write the exothermic reaction with a negative sign. Um, sodium hydrogen carbonate in the second reaction. Now this little delta above here is a little clue that tells you you're going to need to put heat in. Uh, in order to do this, the delta H of the reaction, you have to put in a positive. You don't have to put the plus there. I'm going to put it there just to uh, emphasize it. 129 kilojoules per mole as it's written. And because that's a positive delta H, that's an endothermic reaction. So writing the delta H as the reaction, we're just doing this to show you what to expect when you see this on a, on a test or on a quiz. Now, as I was saying above, those delta H's are written for the reaction as it's written, which means we can apply some stoichiometry. In the second equation, the delta H was 129. I'm not sure why I'm getting that shading. 129 kilojoules for every mole of sodium carbonate because that sodium carbonate has a coefficient of one in front of it. Let me erase that circle there. So that coefficient of one there tells me that since that delta H is written as, re as uh, written for the reaction as written, if I create one mole of sodium carbonate, I'm going to release. I'm sorry, I'm going to absorb 129 kilojoules. However, if I have sodium hydrogen carbonate, my stoichiometry tells me I still have 129 kilojoules, but now because of that coefficient of 2, that's going to be 129 kilojoules absorbed for every 2 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. And so if I only have 1 mole of sodium hydrogen carbonate, I'm going to have to divide by that by 2, and I'm only going to get half the number of kilojoules out for a reaction that only has one mole of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Now, that being said, there's probably only going to be one question to worry about this on uh, because the questions I'm going to ask you uh, on, the, on the quiz next week and um, on the, the test coming up, if I do on, on the test coming up, would have coefficients of one in a special kind of reaction called the combustion reaction. We're going to focus on these combustion reactions because these are extremely important reactions. So we learned back in chapter 10 what combustion, react, combustion reactions are. We're, we're burning. We're burning some sort of a fuel. And the delta H of combustion is sometimes called the heat of combustion. So it's a special kind of heat of a reaction, and there should be a end quote over there. And this is the energy released, and it's always released because these are always negative. These are always exothermic. 
when burning one mole of a fuel. And so we're going to look up a look at different fuels. For example, in this reaction down here, I've got C3H8, which is good old propane, which you may have in your in a in a small white tank uh, in your backyard on your back porch uh, that's powering your barbecue grill. And in the balanced reaction, a mole of propane is going to react with five moles of wa of oxygen to make three moles of CO2 and four moles of H2O, again, making carbon dioxide and water. And when you burn one mole of, of propane, you get a delta H of combustion of negative 2,220 kilojoules per mole. So these reactions do release a lot of energy. Now, if you were to be a person who maybe you get involved with building, designing barbecue grills, and you need to know um how to fuel these things how to make them work so you get just the random amount of heat out you would have to be able to calculate how much energy is released when you burn a certain amount of propane so let's do this this is going to be stoichiometry again but it's going to be kind of simple stoichiometry because it's really only going to be taking grams to moles and once we have moles now we come up to our heat of combustion and we've got that in kilojoules per mole and that really is per mole of the c3h8 so if i want to know how many kilojoules we have this is q um i could put this as q let's leave it as question mark kilojoules because q can get a little confusing we'll use q later on number of kilojoules always start with your single number 28.8 grams of C3H8. Now I'm going to spot you the molar mass. Hopefully you remember that to go from grams to moles, we have one mole of the propane divided by um, 44.09 grams of propane. And if you stop there, you'd just be doing a grams to moles calculation. We cancel the grams though. And we have moles. We don't want moles. We want kilojoules. So now in our second step, we're going to have kilojoules up on top. And we're going to have moles of propane, C3H8, down below. And we get negative 2220 kilojoules for every one mole of propane, right? There's a one in front of the propane in that reaction. The moles of the propane cancel out. And that's going to give us, and keep that negative in there. And you'll see why in the next example, you really want to keep that negative in there. Um, we're going to get negative 1,450 kilojoules. And so that's the answer numerically. You would also then turn around. I say, how much is released? You can leave it as that. The negative sign means released. Or you can just say that 1,450 kilojoules, once you do the calculation, are released. So either way, I'm good with as long as you get the mathematical part right. Now, we can go in reverse. So you want to cook, I don't know, you want to cook some hamburgers, and you know that you need 103,000 kilojoules. Yes, 103,000 kilojoules to cook those hamburgers or if you are if you want veggie burgers, whatever it is you want to cook on the grill. So now we need to go back to the number of grams because as this grill designer, you're going to have to figure out how to get that amount of propane into the grill in the right amount of time. So we want to now have grams of propane as our, as our, our number that we're ending with. And we're going to start with the energy, negative 103 thousand kilojoules again it's a single unit you want to start with that single unit because everything else involved is a conversion factor that's what the stoichiometry means now the conversion factor is going to tell us we're going to put kilojoules on the bottom and we're going to put moles of propane up on top so that the mole so that the kilojoules cancel out now this is why it's important to keep that negative sign if we have the negative sign on the amount of energy that we're starting with, we'd better have a negative sign here, negative 2220, 
so that the negative signs end up canceling out, right? A negative and a negative give us a positive. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a negative mass. And if you end up with a negative mass, some little warning bell should go off in your head and say, you know what? I can't have a negative mass. How many moles of propane? As before, one mole of propane. So you can see the stoichiometry is really pretty straightforward here. Cancel out the kilojoules. And now we have moles of propane. I want grams of propane. As we saw up above, it's 44.09 grams of propane for every one mole of propane. Cancel out the moles of propane and do the math and we get 2,050 grams of propane or just over two kilograms of propane. So that's thermochemical equations, using them to, to uh, go back and forth between energy and grams, energy and mass. Now, in the next examples, we're going to be using uh, a similar technique to what you saw in the lab. And um, this should start looking familiar, especially if you have watched the lab video. So to determine the delta H of a reaction, we have to use a technique called calorimetry, which is the same technique that they used in the lab, except they weren't using it to determine a chemical reaction. They were using it just to find the heat transfer between one object, the metal, and another object, the water. In this case, we're going to use what's called, well, the technique is called calorimetry, and that's just measuring heat exchanged in a process. So technically, the lab is also calorimetry. The calorimeter is this, this device you see to the right. It's some sort of a device that limits the flow of heat to the environment. So in other words, the heat that's inside here can't get out. It gets stopped. So nothing gets through. Anything that's outside here can't get in. It gets stopped as well. So no heat can get in or out. It's an, an insulating device. So it's an insulator that keeps the heat in or out. And that way, all the heat transferred is inside, is kept inside the, the calorimeter. So inside the calorimeter, we have two things. We're going to have water. Water is going to measure the delta T, or we're going to use, we're going to measure the delta T of the water because the water is going to act as the surroundings. And we're going to measure the amount of heat either gained or, or lost by the system as the water temperature changes. So the water is the surroundings, and we're going to have our system, and we'll see what the system is down below in a few moments. Now, we use water because water has a very high specific heat, and the temperature doesn't change very much. Uh, just like having a temperate region, uh, we live in a in a temperate zone. We live in, along a coastline where there's a lot of water, or near enough to the coastline, where there's a lot of water. And that water acts as a heat sink. So in the winter, we don't get quite as cold as as we would in the middle of the continent. And it also acts as a, as a um, place to dump heat into. So during the summer, we don't get quite as hot. And it's because of water's high specific heat. It has one of the highest specific heats. And what we're going to do is use our favorite equation that we've been learning about, Q equals MC delta T for the water, to measure the Q of the water. Now, we can measure the Q of the water because we know its mass, we know its specific heat, and we know we can measure the delta T. According to conservation of energy, the total Q, so this is the Q inside here. So when we talk about the total Q, we're talking about inside this region. This is our Q total is equal to zero. What that means is that nothing's getting in or out so that the Q of the reaction has to equal the negative Q of the water. And those are Qs, not nines, right? So the Q of the reaction is going to equal negative Q of the water. In other words, if the, if the water goes up, then the reaction is going to go down. If the water goes down, the reaction is going to go up. And from that, in joules, we're going to get to our delta H of our reaction. 
And what we're going to do is take that, that Q that we measure, that Q of the reaction, and we are going to calculate what's called the molar enthalpy of the reaction by taking the Q and putting it into an equation dealing with the number of moles of the reaction. So in the end, what we're going to get is that the delta H of the reaction is equal to the Q of the reaction divided by the number of moles of the reactant. Simple calculation. Q of the reaction is just negative Q of the water and divide that by moles of the reactant. So don't get confused. The Q of the reaction is just a negative Q of the water. So let's turn the page and see how this works in a real situation. In this case, we're going to measure the delta H of reaction for dissolving sodium iodide into water. So there's going to be water involved in this, not really a reactant, but it's there, it's present. And even though this is a dissolving reaction, which is really a physical change, it does have an, uh, have a, an uh, enthalpy change, and we can measure that enthalpy change as we as we dissolve the sodium iodide. So the tricky part to watch out for here is we've got two masses we have to worry about. Well, we've got the grams of the sodium iodide. You know, let me redo that. Grams of sodium iodide, circle that. That's our reactant. Put that number aside for right now. Because the first thing we have to do is always have to calculate the Q of the water. Now, in this case, I'm telling you, you have 80 milliliters, but remember that one gram of water, one milliliter is uh, one gram. So this is really 80.0 grams of water. All right, so let's make a note of that. And we know that the temperature increases from our initial temperature to our final temperature. And so we can calculate our delta T Always show me the calculation for delta T, just in case you do something wrong. I can just give you a half point math error rather than a full point for not showing me the calculation. 24.4 degrees C minus 20.5 degrees C. And a quick mental math tells us that's 3.9 degrees C. Now you won't be able to do mental math for all of these things. Um, all right, so we've got our delta T, we've got our mass, we always have specific heat because specific heat is always on chart, um, chart B. So Q of the water, now remember this is always mass C delta T, these are all of the water. Please don't get mixed up with the sodium iodide here. Okay, so we've got 80.0 grams. The specific heat was 4.184 joules per gram times degree C, and the delta T was 3.9. And you know what? I'm going to put, just to emphasize it, it, it did go up, so I'm going to make a positive 3.9 degrees C. And I want to note that that did go up. So when we get the, our answer, it's a positive 1310 joules, right? So the temperature went up and the temperature went up, and so that was a positive number. Okay, put that number aside for a moment. We need another thing. That's how many joules are released into the water when 25.7 grams of sodium iodide dissolves. But we don't have, when we want the molar mass or we want the number of moles, we want to know for one mole. So we need to know how many moles that represents. So sodium iodide, the number of moles, again, moles to mass. You've been doing this the whole year. Hopefully you know how now. 25.7 grams of sodium iodide. And we have one mole of sodium iodide over 149.89 grams of sodium iodide. Grams of sodium iodide are going to cancel out, and we get zero point um one seven no i'm going to bring out to one more sig fig just to 
make sure I don't run into rounding errors. We'll round to three sig figs at the end, and this is going to be moles of sodium iodide. Now, the delta H of the reaction then is equal to the Q of the reaction divided by the moles of the NaI. But remember, the Q of the reaction is equal to negative Q of the water, again, divided by the moles of the NaI. So let's plug in the negative Q of the water. It's a negative 13, 10, uh, and let's put joules inside there, divided by 0 0.1714 moles. I'm going to leave off the sodium iodide there. I don't need that now. The other thing to be careful of is this. Watch what I said here. I said I want this number in kilojoules per mole. Well, we've got our moles there, but we have joules instead. So I've got a convert alert for you. The Q of the water is always in joules. So you want to make sure you calculate to the delta H of the reaction. And I'll always have that in the, in the prompt for the question. Kilojoules per mole is in kilojoules per mole. So we need to put a conversion in here to convert between joules. So put joules in the denominator and kilojoules in the numerator. And remember our conversions, kilo means a thousand. So put the thousand down there and put the one uh, up on top with a kilo. Joules cancel out. That's going to leave us with kilojoules per mole as our answer. Do the math, and you should find that you get negative 7.64 kilojoules per mole. And that would be the delta H of this reaction. A couple of things to note. This is an exothermic reaction. I know it's exothermic for two reasons, and make sure that your reasons all match up. Number one reason, the delta H of the reaction is negative. And also, the temperature, remember this is the temperature of the surroundings, the temperature of the water, the temperature increases. And those both mean an exothermic reaction. All right, uh, watch out on the, on the worksheet. You are going to have at least one endothermic process where your delta T is going to be negative. Your Q of the water is going to be negative. That means your delta H of the reaction is going to be a negative of a negative. It's going to be a positive value. So watch those signs for me. And I will see you next time in class.